Okay, we're ready. Who knows what this weekend is? Labor Day. Labor Day. But who knows? Who knows what Labor Day stands for? Do you know why we celebrate Labor Day? For the workers. Well, let me give you a little rundown on Labor Day uh, because it goes along with the message that God's given me today. So we recognize those who have worked hard and honor their achievements. Labor Day first originated from the Industrial Revolution in America, which brought about manufacturing jobs. But unfortunately, with the manufacturing jobs came 12 to 16 hour shifts, seven days a week. People were discouraged, people were in unsafe and unsanitary working conditions, people became depressed, and someone came forth with the idea that we will have Labor Day for those that are laboring so hard and so diligent and making a difference to our American society. And so they made Labor Day to honor those that labor diligently at their tasks and had numerous achievements. They wanted those achievements to be recognized. Amen? Well, we have a God who has the same heart. How many have labored for the Lord? Now, I'm not meaning just getting up and preaching. Anytime you touch somebody's life and encourage somebody, anytime you achieve anything in your life that reflects on Jesus Christ and his love for us, anytime you pray for someone you care about, Anytime you go into a store and just give someone a smile and make their day because they came in down and discouraged, God sees all that. The Bible says he actually has a book in heaven. Now, there's several books in heaven. I bet there's many, many books in heaven. We know about the book of life, and our name is written in the book of life. It's inscribed there when we give our life to Jesus Christ, when we repent of our sin, and we believe that he died for us, and we say, Lord Jesus, forgive me and come into my heart, and a, a miraculous thing happens. The Spirit of God touches our lives, and we begin to see changes in our life. We see things the way we never saw them before. And God writes our name in the Lamb's Book of Life. And when we stand before God during judgment time, our name will be right there. When God looks, he'll see our name right there in the Lamb's Book of Life. I'm so glad my name is there. Literally there. There are actual books in heaven, and you'll be able to look at your name written there. Now, that's going to be exciting, I think. But there's other books that God has, and he records everything you say. Uh-oh. Everything you do. Oh, I wish you didn't, Lord. But everything we say, everything we do, and let's get on a positive note here, the good things that we say, the good things that we do to honor our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the works that are in our life because we love him. We don't work for salvation. Our works don't get us in heaven. We work because we're in love with him. And because we recognize what he did for us, we want to give back something to him. So today, the Lord gave me a message, and he said, tell my people, I'm hiring. I'm hiring for Labor Day. We see a lot of signs around the town, don't we? Hiring at McDonald's, hiring at Burger King, hiring at all different places. But we forget that God is hiring. God is looking for laborers for his kingdom. So turn with me, if you have your Bible, to Matthew chapter 9, and we're going to read what Jesus said about laboring for him. 
In Matthew chapter 9, starting with verse 35, and Jesus went about all the cities and the villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted, they were weary, they were tired, and they were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Here is the heart of Jesus looking at the people, following him diligently. He has healed every manner of sickness, every manner of disease, and they're following him, and you would too if you had a sickness and you had a disease and you saw what he was doing. And he had compassion on them because they were tired and they began to lay down in the field. And then it touched Jesus' heart. Do you think Jesus cares about what you go through? Oh, yes, he does. He knows your every thought. He knows your every burden. He feels your every pain. Physically, spiritually, and emotionally. He feels your pain. Amen? And so with that in his heart, with that compassion in his heart, he says, then he said unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray, therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. You see, this is the heart of God today. This is the heart of Jesus today. Because he cares about those that are out in the highways and the byways. He wants you to compel them to come in because they're hurting. That's what church is about. It's about coming in and worshiping the Lord because he wants a relationship with us, because he loves us so deeply. He is so compassionate about everything that involves your life. He cares. And so with that heart that was so burdened down, when he looked at them laying down, he looked at them about to faint, they were so weary, he looked at his disciples and he said, there is so much work to be done, but who will do it? He was trying to impress on his disciples how important their job would be when he left this earth, that he was entrusting them with a labor of love, a labor of reaching out to those that were hurting and letting them know there's the gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ is alive and that he will save their soul and give them eternal life. Amen? Amen. Wow, Lord. I'm so glad he loves me that way, aren't you? I'm so glad that not one thought in my mind that troubles my mind, he does not already know and have a solution for and care about. So he said, pray. He told his disciples, pray. There's a great harvest out there, but we need workers. I want to encourage you today. It's Labor Day for God, too, in the sense that he wants to recognize the things that you have done for him. He wants you to know today that they have not gone, gone unnoticed. Everything you've done for the Lord is in that book. Amen? Now turn with me quickly to John chapter 4. And we'll see a repetition of this concept, but in a little bit different manner. John the disciple had heard the same thing that Matthew had heard. And the Spirit of God came on him. Now in John chapter 4, Jesus had just met the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. And he had told her all about her previous marriages. Here we see again a picture 
picture of Jesus caring and having compassion on somebody that's hurting. She went through marriage after marriage, and Jesus said, and the man you're with right now isn't even your husband, but I have a solution for you. I can give you living water so you are never thirst again. That thirst to be loved, that thirst to be needed, that thirst to be wanted. I have a solution for you. I am that living water. And if you drink of me, you will never thirst again. And while he was talking to the woman, his disciples went into town to get some bread. And the woman, she was so touched and realized that Jesus was the Messiah. She ran back to town. He told me everything about myself. This must be the Messiah that we've heard about. And in verse 28, the woman then left her water pot. She went away into the city and said to the man, Come and see a man which told me all things that even I did. Is not this the Christ? Now he knows everything you do. He told her things that she had done, but he knows everything you do. He knows everything that concerns you this morning. He knows every thought that's gone into your head about that particular concern. And he wants to tell you today, it's going to be all right, because he's right there with you. And then they came out of the city and came to him. The people came to Jesus, but as they're coming to him, in the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him or asked him, saying, Master, eat. They had come back with food, and they knew he was hungry, and they knew he hadn't eaten in a while, and they come back on this uh, errand, and they bring the food, and they say, Master, have some to eat. But he said to them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore, said the disciples one to another, has any man brought him or to eat? Did somebody feed him or move God? And Jesus knew what they were saying. Jesus knew what they were thinking. And Jesus said to them, my meat, the thing that sustains me, the thing that gives me strength, the thing that means the most to me, my meat, is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Say ye not, or don't say, there are only four months and then comes the harvest. You see, the Jews had a saying. They would look to the fields and they would say, there's only four more months and then the harvest. But Jesus says to them, don't say this, there are yet four months and then cometh the harvest because I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, the spiritual fields, the people's souls, but they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receives wages. Oh wow, Lord, when you are hiring us, there's wages? Well, that's good to know, Lord. And he that reapeth Reapeth, receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto eternal life, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. Now, I wasn't talking about physical, material wages. So God will supply your every need. When you are willing to allow God to use you and labor for the kingdom, God will take care of your every need. When you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, doing what's right, all these things will be added unto you that you need. But you see, Jesus was trying to tell his disciples there aren't enough laborers and the harvest isn't going to be four months from now. The harvest is right now. And God wants us to take on that mentality and that attitude. The harvest for souls isn't down the line somewhere. You know, sometimes we get the attitude, well, I'm not going to do this today for the Lord. I mean, I'm kind of busy or, or, you know, I don't know what God wants me to do today. And we get this attitude of, well, the Lord may not come so soon. And, and you know, we know he's coming, but it might not be today, and I've got plans for today. I mean, if he comes, that would be great. And we take on uh, 
mentality that's focused on the world and on the earth and not on spiritual things. But Jesus is trying to show them there's an urgency here. And if never before there was an urgency in our world today and in America today for souls to come to Jesus Christ, it's now. It's now. There's an urgency. People are going to die and go to hell if we don't speak up. People are going to die and go to hell if we don't pray them in. What about that person we could have handed a track to, but we left the tracks in the car for God? We could have changed somebody's life. We need to be urgent and diligent about what we do because Jesus has a heart that this is, this is an urgent time. We are coming up to Rosh Hashanah this week. In Jerusalem, Israel, it will start tomorrow at 6 p.m. In America, we will begin to recognize it at 7 I'm sorry, not on the 7th, I meant to say, not 7 p.m. They start their day at 6 p.m. They go from darkness to light, their day. But on the 7th is when we uh, understand Rosh Hashanah and know that it's a holiday. But it's not just a holiday, folks. Every one of the festivals is God's calendar appointment. And God will meet every appointment. He already knows the day it's appointed. Passover was God's divine appointment for Jesus to die. Unleavened bread was God's appointment to say that his son was sinless. First fruits was God's appointment to say Jesus Christ would rise from the dead. And he'd be the first to rise and will rise with him. Pentecost was God's appointment to bring us the Holy Ghost to fill us with his power so we could go out and we could tell the world that Jesus Christ is alive. And Rosh Hashanah is a feast of trumpets which declares that God will rapture the church. It's in God's divine appointment that Jesus Christ will come and meet us on the clouds and call us home. Listen for that trumpet. Be aware that trumpet will sound. If you're a born-again believer, you're going to hear that so far. And in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, you will be changed. And then you'll begin to rise from this earth just like Jesus rose. You'll be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye, just like that you'll be changed. But you'll rise like Jesus rose and they watched him go into the clouds. You'll rise into those clouds and meet him there if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and you have diligently followed him and loved him because he says, I'm coming for all those that love me and long for my appearing, Jesus says. We need to be examining our hearts every day. Lord, do we really love you? Are we so focused on ourselves or are we focused on you? Do we have the heart of compassion that you have? You had a heart that when you saw that the harvest was ready, you said, we need laborers. Will, will you go? Will you go? Let us have that same heart. Lord, that we would take opportunity and use every opportunity. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 14 through 16 says this, Wherefore he says, Awake thou that sleepeth, and arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. He'll enlighten you. Shake yourself off, those that don't know Jesus Christ. Seek him and you'll find him. He'll enlighten you to see that he is the only way. He is indeed the truth. And he is the life. See that you walk circumspectly. That means to consider the circumstances around you and the consequences of what you do. 
See that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. We are in an evil time, folks. They are murdering babies in the womb. We are in an evil time, folks. They have persecuted and beheaded and dismembered Christians in Afghanistan. I was told by somebody, we were at the pastor's prayer meeting for just Jesus coming up on September 12th here at the Lugoff Elgin High School and there was a man there that is involved with Gideons and he was telling how someone was on the phone with a missionary in Afghanistan talking to them this week when in the middle of the conversation of them asking him just pray, pray the situation is so sincere, uh, so, so dangerous. And he had such a sincere heart. And while he's talking to the man on the phone, he hears gunshots and the phone went dead. And those missionaries went home to be with the Lord. We've got it so easy here. We've got it so easy here, folks. Yet God sees everyone who's laid down their life for him this week. And he's crying out to us who live in America, who have a life where we got a roof over our head and food on our table to get on our knees and start interceding for our brothers and our sisters who are suffering. Bring them home to America again, Lord. Make a way to get them out of that evil land. Bring them home again to us, Lord. Bring them home safely, Lord. There's an urgency as never before. We must redeem the time, making the most of our time. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, Behold, now is the time, the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We may not have tomorrow. September 7th might be that very day that the rapture takes place and many people are going to die when that occurs because planes will fall out of the sky. Cars will crash into poles, telephone poles. Fires will be ignited. People on their jobs will disappear and their machinery that they're working will be left unmanned. If you foolishly think that you can accept Jesus Christ after the rapture. I had somebody say to me, someone I love very dearly, well, if the rapture takes place, then what you're telling me is true. I will make it right with God. I pray to God you can make it right with him. I pray to God that you will exist still. I pray to God that your life isn't taken from you and you have that opportunity during the tribulation to make it right with God. But you will be beheaded. You will be dismembered. Now is the time to give your life to Christ before all this begins to happen. And it's going to be a suddenly. It's going to suddenly happen. When you least expect it, it's going to suddenly happen. And the whole world is going to be changed. Just like when the Taliban went into Afghanistan, it suddenly came on so many people. Just like last week when people were in their basement apartments and the water suddenly came on them and their life was required of them. This is nothing to play around with. And we that know the Lord must redeem the time. Load yourselves up with the word of God so you know what to say to those that you meet. Speak to them in love and woo them and compel them because time is short. When Jesus sounds that, when that angel sounds that trumpet and Jesus comes down on the cloud, I want to be doing what he called me to do. I want to meet him in the cloud and him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter in. Turn with me now to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6. We see that Isaiah had a vision and he stood before the Lord. And as he stood before the Lord, he saw the seraphims and the creatures that were surrounding God crying out, holy, holy, holy. And then in verse 5 of 
chapter 6 of Isaiah. Then said I, and this is Isaiah, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah saw Jesus. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongues from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched your lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord, that's Jesus Christ, saying, Whom shall I send? Or who will go for us? The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Who will go for us? Jesus asking, who will go for us? Then said I, here am I. Send me. Is that the cry of your heart today? Here am I, Lord. Send me. Now you might say, well, Pastor, I don't know whether I'm equipped for this. I'm not even sure what to say to people. But if you look at this in the word, Isaiah said the same thing. Oh, woe is me. I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. But the angel came down with the burning coal of fire and destroyed every bit of what he felt would deter him from speaking God's word and going out to the Lord. And he was purged. And if you are covered in the blood of Jesus today, you don't have to worry what you'll say. That same Holy Spirit will touch your lips and he'll fill your mouth and he'll show you what to do. Amen? Again, go with me to Acts chapter 9 and we see the same thing. Acts chapter 9. In Acts chapter 9, we see Paul or Saul down the road to Damascus on a mission to kill Christians, thinking that he is doing the right thing, thinking that he is following God with all his heart. But anyone who professed to be of the way, that's what they called the first church, the way. Anyone who professed to be of the way, Saul was going to try to lock up and put in prison to stop this that was spreading so fast. But as we can see today, we are sitting in the way church because Jesus is the way. And has the devil stopped it? No, the devil can't stop the word of God going forward. The devil can't stop the gospel message. The devil can't stop salvation. The devil can't stop souls from being saved. But that was what Saul wanted to do, stop this hypocrisy. He thought it was, yet he was the hypocrite. And in verse 5, well, let's go just to verse 3. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? Man, that was a wake-up call. Amen? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest, and it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. No wonder why Paul said, Awake thou that sleepeth and rise from the dead. Because he had a wake up call that day. And he, Paul, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what will you have me to do? Just like Isaiah, here I am, Lord, I'll go. Paul says, what will you have me to do? What will you have me to do, Lord? Can you ask yourself that question today? What will you have me to do, Lord? You see, God is hiring. And he's looking for lay 
laborers that will fill out an application for the job. Will you apply yourself? Will you apply yourself, your heart, your soul, your mind to the word of God and doing what God is calling us to do? Well, what are the qualifications just to be in Christ? If you are in Christ Jesus, the Holy Spirit will use your mouth and he will speak through you. If you get baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost, he will send you forth and give you an unction like never before and a boldness like never before to speak forth his word. An application for the job. Lord, I want to apply. How about you? What are the qualifications? To be in Christ, the blood of Jesus. But there's some other qualifications. To work for the Lord, not to be saved. You have to surrender everything. You see how Isaiah said, here I am, Lord, send me. See how Paul said the same thing, basically? What do you want me to do? Just like we sang this morning, I surrender all. It takes obedience to follow Christ. It takes boldness when you're faced with someone who's in your face telling you there is no God. You stand on your faith and God will be with you. But not only does God tell us about qualifications? He tells us that we have an on-the-job training. A one-on-one -on -one training with the Holy Spirit. Jesus tells us in John chapter 14, verse 26, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatever I have said unto you. The Holy Spirit will teach you what you need to say. The Holy Spirit will baptize you and fill you to overflowing and give you an unction like never before that you can reach the lost. In fact, Jesus told them, don't even go out until the promise of the Father has come. And then you shall, you shall be my witnesses. Well, when the on-the-job training, the one-on-one -on -one training, there's something else here in 1 Corinthians 3, 9. God assures us that he's right there with us. He's not going to say, do this job and desert you. I have to remind myself of that a lot of times because getting up in front of people and allowing the Holy Spirit to use my mouth and the human in me comes out sometimes and I say, Lord, I fouled up that word or this or that, but God says to me, I haven't deserted you. I will take what you give me and I will make it into what it needs to be. Are we perfect? No. I'm the first one to say I'm not perfect. I listen to some of my YouTube and videos here on Facebook and I say, oh, I messed that word up. But I know in my heart, no matter how unperfect I am, the word is perfect. And any time I speak the word, something's going to be accomplished even if my word isn't perfect. Amen. For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry or crops that he cares for. You are God's building. And then we have the assurance of Luke. The Holy Spirit spoke through Luke, and he wanted us to know this as he penned this. Behold, I give you power, God says, to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Say that with me. All all the power of the enemy, not just some, all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now Mark, he also understood this by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. He tells us this, and these signs shall follow them that believe. 
And trust, we're going to say that belief means trust. We went over that Wednesday. That word believe there means those that trust. It takes trust to let those signs flow through you. Do you not know that? But these are the signs when you trust Jesus and are surrendered to him and obedient to him. These are the signs that will follow those that believe and trust him. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents or the devil. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and the sick shall recover. The sick shall recover. We know that, don't we? We see recovery sitting right in this room. We see prayers that went forth that brought recovery right in this room because what God says in his word is true. Now go back with me to Matthew. We're almost winding down here, so be patient with me. It's only 10 after 12. But go back to Matthew 10. We're going to go a little forward from what Jesus had said in the beginning when he said, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into the harvest. And here in Matthew 10, starting with verse 5, Jesus gives them instructions. These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, or instructed them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now that did not mean that God didn't care about the Gentiles, and God didn't care about the Samaritans, but he came first to Israel, because Israel was the one that was supposed to be spreading the good news that he was the Messiah. That was entrusted to them. They were God's people. And during the tribulation, 144,000 Jews are noted that they will be spreading the word of God throughout the tribulation that Jesus Christ is indeed their Messiah. But listen what he told them to do. And as you go, preach saying the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom sent from heaven. That's what that means. The kingdom sent from heaven. What is the kingdom sent from heaven? That's the thousand year reign when Christ sets himself up as king. He first came as a baby and he came to save us. He didn't come in glory when he came. He came in a lowly manger, but he'll come again in glory. He will usher in the kingdom sent from heaven. And he told his disciples, tell them that kingdom's coming. And then he said, heal the sick. That's what he told his disciples. I'm empowering you. Heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers. Raise the dead. Cast out devils. Freely you have received. Freely give. Freely give. That's what Jesus is saying today. I want to hire you. The time is urgent. I will allow you to, what is the way I want to say, Lord, show me, help me what you're trying to say. I will allow you to experience my Holy Spirit, which will empower you. You see, God didn't have to allow that. But he gave us that baptism of the Holy Spirit, that power to empower us to do what he called us to do. He allowed that. He's allowing you to enter into heaven and giving you eternal life. He's allowing you to be one of his laborers. And he wants to encourage you on this Labor Day weekend that he's pleased. Keep on working for Jesus. Don't give up. Don't faint. Let's be more diligent than ever before. Amen? Let's see the urgency. We've got neighbors that don't know the Lord. Let's see the urgency. Lord, bring them in our past so we can just say a few things to them about the gospel. So we can pray for them. And maybe they'll come into our Wednesday night prayer meetings, our Wednesday night Bible studies, and find the Lord, or grow in the Lord. Amen? That's why God has them there. 
there. He wants to reach our neighborhood. And if our whole neighborhood was on fire for God, and those surrounding our neighborhood, right on down to the way church was only a couple miles, if when we have the revival at Blue Book Elgin High School coming up on September 12th with just Jesus, can you imagine what will happen in Elgin and Blue Book? It will all feel the urgency. That's what's happening with just Jesus. Pastors from all over feel the urgency to preach and let this community of Kershaw County know Jesus Christ is soon to come. Well, lastly, there are great benefits when you serve the Lord. You know, there's a tremendous paycheck. Not only will he supply your every need down here, like I said, but I have not seen, I've said it every week, but I like to focus on that. Your eye has not seen, your ear has not heard, neither has entered into your heart the great things, the wonderful things, the beautiful things, the peaceful things, the loving things that God has prepared for those who love him. Wow. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, this is Paul again speaking, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. Your labor is not in vain. So this weekend as you think of Labor Day, and you probably won't even be thinking much about Labor Day other than if you work, I don't have to go to work. If you don't work, you might be thinking, wow, barbecue, coming up, amen, what are you cooking? Chicken, steak, I'm heading over. Anyway, um, but this weekend, let's focus on something else. When you gather together for that barbecue, if you've got friends coming, if you've got family coming, say, Lord, give me a loving heart, a compassionate heart like you had to speak in love, but to warn them. Not to tell them what they're not, but to tell them what they can be. You see, that's where we sometimes go very wrong. We look and we see the sin, and we know that God doesn't like that sin. And we know we've been delivered from sin. And we know we ourselves even can fall. But sometimes we focus so much on the person's problem, if they're on drugs or alcohol or something like that, that we neglect to see what God could make them if they turn around, if they allow Jesus to come into their life. And that's what repenting means. It doesn't just mean going to the altar or praying and saying, God, forgive me of my sin. It requires a turnaround, turning away from evil and turning and embracing the one that loves you. Amen? So this Labor Day, let's focus on God's urgency. He's asking you this morning, can I hire you? Will you go? Will you surrender? Will you be obedient? You're qualified. I'll teach you. I'll give you power over all the power. I'll give you everything you need. I'm going to say yes, Lord, I'll go. Amen. Amen. Let's just stand to our feet. I want to just take one minute to have quiet prayer between you and the Lord. Feel him pulling at your heart. The time is so short. Feel the heart of Jesus that he wants souls to be saved in compassion. So let's just have a moment of silent prayer. Dear Lord, the reward you have for us is great. Not material. Not even physical. Eternal life. Forever and ever dwelling with you in peace and joy. No more tears. No more death. 
No more sorrow. Oh, Lord, what a reward you've given us to be able to see your face. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Father, I ask you if there's anyone listening this morning to this broadcast on YouTube or Facebook that has not truly accepted you, Lord, that they today will take this very seriously. Jesus, you are coming. It could even be this week. This could be the Rosh Hashanah that the trumpet sounds. Lord, help us to surrender, to push back our own self-will and only to desire your will. Lord, that we might sincerely follow after you with our whole heart and in obedience. Lord, I'm asking that you put people in our path this week that we can share the good news of the gospel with, Lord. Give us the words in our mouth, Lord, and let us see life. Oh, that just one more soul will be saved because we were obedient, Lord. Jesus, help us to live every day as if we're leaving, mindful that the time is so short. And we will thank you and give you glory. And Lord, as we go home today, I ask that you would surround us, bring us safely to our homes, and I thank you for your presence here today and for your beautiful word, Lord. And everybody say, Amen. God bless you. Go ahead and say hello and fellowship a little bit. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen. Hallelujah.